Hello, everybody. My name's Michael Lawrence. I'm a director at Insight. Uh, welcome to Insight Talks. We're here to talk about uh, arbitration uh, in the construction sector, and I have with me today Louise Wright. Louise is uh, a lawyer with Sol International. So, Louise, perhaps you could start by introducing yourself. Yes. Um, so, thank you, Michael. I uh, qualified at the Bar of England and Wales, um, and I worked in the UK for many years before then moving over to the UAE approximately five years ago. Uh, I started working in local firms um, and then I moved over to work with Sarah and the team at Sol uh, very recently. Um, we specialise in disputes and particularly I, I specialise in construction so deal a lot with construction arbitrations mm -hmm. um, but any sort of litigation we're both common law lawyers, both Sarah and I um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the hot topic, of course, in Dubai and the arbitration scene is uh, Decree 34 from uh, September of last year. And um, I've noticed uh, certainly uh, some perhaps unintended consequences or impact through the uh, introduction of the decree. Um, one of the features of it is the, the default DIFC seat um, if the parties don't have a seat specified within their, within their agreement. And I've certainly seen one party um, have that uh, consequence of the decree uh, arising without them perhaps um, you know, understanding that was happening. Um, there's also been a certain amount of delay, I suppose, which is inevitable when you're, when you're putting in big changes, and that delay has uh, impacted on perhaps the appointment of arbitrators and, uh, and so on while we move from one, one system to another, and through, uh, through the funds as well, because I, had, I was involved with one case where it was actually a DIFC-LCIA award. We got the award before the change, but now the parties are trying to get the balance of their money back, which is now held in, in this uh, uh, situation where, the, where the, the system has changed. I just wonder, have you, have you also suffered any uh, sort of unintended consequences of <laughs> through, the, through the new decree, which I guess in turn will, will sort itself out, but uh, what has been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to look behind the intention of the new decree. Mm. Um, and it is to give the, to put Dubai on the map. Um, arguably, when it comes to international arbitration, Dubai was well and truly on the map. And, mm. and we'll come to perhaps the reasons as to, as to why that was the case. Um, what the decree set out to do is to sort of bring the three local centres together um, and consolidate them, merge them under one umbrella. So the intention is positive and hopefully we will see it develop into um, a well-structured, um, reputable centre where we can uh, draw um, positive international attention um, mm. and develop arbitration within the region. Mm. There have, as with everything that, that uh, starts out on such a scale, there's mm. of course going to be teething problems mm. and bumps in the road. Um, yes, unfortunately, like you've um, stated, I have also experienced um, some delays, some issues since the decree was um, brought into force in September. Um, my situation sounds a little bit different to yours, and, and one example that I can give um, is that we were waiting on the rendering of the final award, mm. and parties had been notified by the arbitrator that the award had been sent in its draft form to the centre, which mm. is the DIFC-LCIA. Mm. They had made their comments, mm. sent it back for final review with the arbitrator, um, and it was ready to be to be rendered. Mm. Parties had paid in full the advance uh, on costs. Yeah. 
Um, so, of course, the DIFC LCIA rules state that if parties have not paid their advance on costs, mm. then the award can be withheld. Yeah. What isn't covered, interestingly, in the, the DIFC LCIA rules is what happens in a situation like we've got at the moment. Mm. And what had happened is, since the parties had settled their advance on costs in full and mm. timely, the center, we'd of course had then had the decree come into force mm. and for reasons that have not been explained, but mm. I think mm. we're aware of what the issues are with the, the amalgamation or the mm. merge of the, the centers, that the, the transfer of funds hadn't been made from the center mm. to then pay the arbitrator. Right. So the arbitrator was not in funds. Yeah. So the arbitrator's argument was, well, I am withholding the award mm. until my fees have been satisfied. Which it's entitled to do. Yeah. Ex well, <laughs> well, I mean, I that's <laughs> arguable, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. Because under the rules, under the no, rules no. parties have paid exactly. their costs in full. Mm. Um, and, and the fact that the centre, mm. um, which is, of course, uncharted waters, really, because yeah. we've never had a situation that I'm aware of where no. the centre, being in funds, has not paid the arbitrator's fees. Mm. Um, so you can see the, you can have empathy with the arbitrator who has done mm. their duty and fulfilled their obligations, mm. but is not in, in, uh, in funds. So um, mm. the situation at the moment is there's almost like a standoff where mm. the arbitrator um, is not rendering the award and yeah. parties are arguing, well, this delay, sh we, we shouldn't be um, subject or victim of, of the consequences of this yeah. new decree and everything that's happened. And I guess, I guess that's not covered under the federal arbitration law either. It's not. Uh, whereas in other jurisdictions, I think certainly in the UK, um, you know, the, under the act there, if the, it, it does say, you know, if the arbitrator, once he's paid, you know, he releases the award and it, and it sort of talks in those terms, I think, in the UK. But here, it's, I don't think it's covered. No, it's mm. not. It's sort yeah. of the other side that if parties haven't paid their advance on costs, well, they have. Yeah, um, yeah. interesting. So it is interesting. And I'm sure, you know, if, mm. if you and I sitting here mm. can give examples of, yeah. of delays and consequences mm. of, the, of the new decree, mm. then I'm sure there are many yeah. more, um, mm. and more stories to be told. Do you think parties will now have a tendency to perhaps look at the ICC and the ADGM as, a, as an alternative until, you know, the dust settles and everybody sees, uh, you know, what's happening moving forward? Um, I think so. I think parties mm. who uh, would come to the, the region um, for the protection of the well-founded LCIA mm -hmm. would be minded to look for a similar institution and, and mm. well, as you've suggested, they mm. have the comfort of the ADGM yeah. um, ICC. Mm. What I think and what I have on good authority at the moment mm. is that DIAC actually are, is in talks with the LCIA. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it is interesting and I yeah. think they mm. that would be a positive step yeah um, because then of course as we've said those mm. who want the comfort of a well-founded established LCIA um, will continue having that mm. um, confidence in the, d the DIAC yeah um, if it doesn't go forward I think what what there is a risk of is that the LCIA will have talks with the ADGM and yeah. we will see an ADGM LCIA yeah. as well as uh, an ADGM ICC. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That you know that that's not reinventing the wheel. It's been done in other jurisdictions um, okay. similarly. Yeah. So I think the DIAC would be um, it would be a positive step if DIAC yeah. continue these talks, which I have had on good authority. Mm. They are doing so. Mm. Hopefully, we will see something positive come out of those talks. Yeah, that would be good. I mean. Certainly, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I've always felt when, when we look at, you know, was the merger needed, etc. Um, it's always been quite a struggle explaining to parties the differences of, about the benefits of, of DIAC versus DIFCL, CIA, and the confusion of the parties between having two 
organizations um, with you know different characteristics and then it became perhaps even more confusing for parties when DIAC set up in the DIFC uh, you know then when you really sat down and you tried to explain to, to the parties who are you know, not, not trained in arbitration or law um, what the consequences and you know what what you should put into the agreement and so on um, it was it was confusing so I think that's one positive aspect of the merger is that at least if the, you know we can get one body and do it well and I, and uh, I don't know if you were at the event in Dubai Arbitration Week um, when DIAC uh, explained the whole proposal but one of the things they said is they want to be in the top five uh, in the world in terms of um, arbitration so so they want to be and when somebody said uh, you know that we want to be in the top five immediately somebody then came onto the stage and said well no we want to be in the top three not the top five and you know Dubai does seem to have this very ambitious uh, goals which um, you know they do achieve uh, so perhaps you know moving forward there, there is a positive step but um, I mean what are the benefits and con or concerns about the, the decree uh, 34 I think you've mentioned some of them but what do you feel about where we might end up with enforcement of some of these awards, especially uh, in overseas jurisdictions, perhaps where uh, somebody's trying to enforce the award and the other party can perhaps come back and and you know use it as a defence. Do you anticipate that being a problem? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we know, mm -hmm. you know, we, you and I have both um, been involved in enough arbitrations to know mm -hmm. that um, it is often the case that parties always play the tactical card yeah uh, that's from the outset you yeah. know whether it's the respondent the jurisdictional not paying challenge their, absolutely <laughs> not paying their advance on costs anything yeah. to, to cause delays and issues for the yeah. other party mm. um, and because of course it's such a party-led um, arena mm. it the, the, they perhaps get away with that more so than they do in litigation yeah and I think you're right. I think that's ultimately the, the biggest risk for any party involving um, the dispute resolution clause that states either DIFC, LCIA, um, or, or, or arguably DIAC, depending on how we see the, the future of uh, the, the DIAC, so to speak. Mm. Parties, the losing party ultimately, will, I'm sure, be putting forward the argument that, well, Mm. Yeah, th this was um, th this so arbitration proceeded under DIAC. If you look to our dispute resolution clause, we have opted mm. for DIFC LCIA. Yeah, we're not party to this arbitration agreement. This, mm. you know, this should yeah. never have taken place. Um, mm. the, the award should not be recognised. I think in the UAE, uh, they probably wouldn't win that argument. But you, you do have to wonder, perhaps, in uh, some of the overseas. If you're trying to enforce it overseas, what will happen? Yeah, mm. um, but mm. you will always have parties making that yeah. argument. And I mm. think what I've seen um, wh when it comes to matters of not public policy, but mm. not wanting to offend a state or mm. Um, mm. a region, uh, you do get other jurisdictions who tread very carefully in how they deal with such arguments. Mm. And often... Um, interpretation or correct interpretation of of the law mm. um, can almost be a side issue to a court or a jurisdiction not wanting to offend mm. um, and and we've seen that that does happen so yeah. how going forward uh, the courts in other jurisdictions and in this region mm. will deal with any such argument will be an interesting point yeah so so sort of in summary on this on this uh, particular subject, how do you see um, the, the future of arbitration in Dubai? And uh, are you optimistic that uh, this will actually ultimately lead to a positive change? I think if you'd have asked me that question a couple of weeks ago, I would have had mm. a different answer, mm. uh, quite honestly. Mm. Um, w it's here. Yeah. It's not going away. No. Um, 
I think we have to deal with it positively mm. and be optimistic about its future. Mm. We know why it was um, why it was brought into play, mm. um, and I think it was brought with the best intentions. There will be hiccups. There will be bumps in the road. There will be the arguments um, that lawyers will be having for many years to come. I'm sure, mm. based on the very things that we've we've discussed. Parties came to, for example, TFCLCIA for that comfort of mm. having an established centre. Unless something happens to make that huge step and give businesses who are drafting their contracts, mm. who uh, are taking advice of the lawyers and the lawyers who are giving the advice as to what centre should be um, used in a dispute resolution clause. If they haven't got the comfort that they have a centre mm. which can deal with um, these arguments mm. and protect their clients or protect themselves, whoever it may be, from such arguments moving forward or from such uncertainty, mm. if the region can do something about that and give that comfort, then mm. I, I think this will be a huge leap forward for the region yeah. and it will put Dubai on the map, mm. absolutely. Mm. But I think we need to see what's going to happen in the next few weeks mm. um, and see what the LTIA are going to do. Yeah. Uh, before we can say with any degree of certainty how much of an impact this mm. will have. I think we are at a stage where it could go one way or the other. Yeah. I'm hopeful that mm. the right decisions will be taken in the immediate future. Mm. Um, but if, as we've said, if the LTIA do engage in talks with, for example, the ADGM, I think... DIAC will have done themselves an injustice perhaps mm. um, because I think parties need the confidence in an established mm. centre and yeah. one which they can be guaranteed is not going to be altered or offended by a mere mm. by a mere drafting of a, uh, you know somebody sitting with a pen who can rewrite the law and everything changes overnight. Mm. They need that certainty yeah. and someone a body such as the LCIA mm offers that degree of certainty. Mm. So let's hope that there are uh, positive um, decisions made in, mm. the, in the near future. I am aware as well that, um, and I had also on good authority, that the new rules are imminent. Yeah, I was going to mention that because um, there's a bit of a waiting game going on, I think, at the moment, because I'm sure there's many cases pending, but parties are perhaps taking the view that wait and see what happens with the new rules because of course if they launch a case now it's going to be under the 2007 rules whereas perhaps if they wait a few more weeks and uh, and see what these new rules say then uh, they'll have the benefit of uh, um, you know a more modernized uh, set of arbitration rules so I'm pretty sure that there are many parties doing that um, I hope so. I, mm. I mean, it's ex it's an exciting time for mm. everybody involved in arbitration. Mm. Um, you know, practitioners, academics, uh, businesses. Mm. It is an exciting time, and if they get the rules right, mm. I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, that'll be a big step. I mean, the other thing is, of course, dealing with the legacy because there's a lot of. Uh, agreements out there that which still say DIFC LCIA which were drafted before all this happened and and potentially a lot of those could end up in dispute so so that legacy uh, is going to have to sort of feed through the system as well and uh, dealing with all of those uh, those cases and possibly there are even people still putting DIFC LCIA in their agreements now sure. not perhaps uh, aware of the of the changes, you know, and that's it, isn't it? I mean, mm. y you know, those of us who deal with arbitration mm. um, don't necessarily involve ourselves in the drafting of contracts. No. They're a different specialism. Yeah, um, and we just hope that those who are drafting the dispute resolution clauses for their clients mm. are fully au fait with what is happening. I'm sure they are. 
Um, yeah, but I'm, like you said, it, I, I'm sure I'm there not, are. I'm still. sure they are, but also, you know, as you know, uh, dealing with construction cases, um, contracts aren't always put together by uh, legal counsel. Yeah. Um, they are very often boilerplates that they just use from one contract to the next. And this is why, you know, we are still dealing with uh, FIDIC 1987. And uh, even in, I had one case where I actually had to purchase the previous version of FIDIC, which was from 1970 something, you know. And this is because parties, you know, they get something they're used to and they just keep photocopying and changing a few things and using it from one contract to the next. And particularly when you get down to subcontractors and people like this. So you could well find that the DIFC LCIA is uh, there as a clause yep. for the next three, four, five years in many cases. It you know? will. It will, it will yeah. be featured in many contracts. But yeah. of course, it makes our job more exciting yeah. than when we've come Alongside to have these Alongside FIDIC 87, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Moving away p from uh, the arbitration scene and perhaps more generally into you know the construction and construction law arena, um, in uh, last year in uh, the American Bureau of, St of um, Labor Statistics um, said that women only account for 10.9 percent of the construction industry in the U.S. Um, and they were they were pleased to report that that was actually a 1% increase on the year before. Um, and, of course, construction is very heavily, uh, you know, biased or, or, you know, discriminatory to that towards women coming into the industry. Um, what is your feeling about the balance in construction law? Is that, is that also as heavily biased as the construction industry itself, or is the is there more hope there? Um, both. Mm. Um, th there is still uh, inequality and imbalance, mm. if you like. Um, but it is recognised, and I think that's a huge step. Mm. Once something is recognised, we can all we can all do something to yeah. resolve that. And the fact that you, as you've said, there are mm. statistics out there. Mm. That in itself is a is something that's positive because it means that people are going out and asking these questions and finding out this information. And once we're, uh, once we're with knowledge of that information, then mm. something can be done. It's mm. when there's nothing, when everybody is quiet about it yeah. um, and trying to see or, or trying to push it away as it not being a problem, mm. that's when there is a problem. Yeah. Um, yes, there is still an imbalance, um, mm. both in... in um, practitioners mm. and with arbitrators as well yeah. um, generally not just mm. construction based arbitrations mm. um, but that is a lot to do with the mindset so one feeds into the other and as you've said um, women are not represented equally in construction I think Spain is mm. a country where mm. um, they have probably they're, they're achieving Mm. Uh, an equality of women working in construction, yeah. which is interesting and yeah. positive. Mm. Uh, that will then naturally have an impact on the confidence that those working in construction have in <coughs> their colleagues um, mm. to represent them in construction law. Mm. Uh, of course, we have uh, nominated arbitrators, mm. and when you have parties who are predominantly, um, sorry to say it, the male pale and stale as, mm. as we, we mm. say it mm. um, then they of course look to who they have more confidence with mm. in um, and that is unfortunately the more experienced arbitrators maybe mm. because of the previous gender um, inequality and imbalance that we've seen yeah. the more experienced arbitrators and practitioners quite naturally mm. are male mm. Um, mm. So whilst we have more females s qualifying as lawyers and qualifying yes. as arbitrators, mm. they're not as experienced. Mm. So when some a party is looking for experience, mm. naturally, yeah. of course, because of how things have developed over the years, mm. there is always going to be that imbalance. So mm. 
yes, there is still a, an imbalance, mm. sadly, and yes, we're still having this conversation, which, mm. you know, is good that yeah. we're having it, but should we still be having it in 2022? Mm. Um, you know, we went to an awards ceremony um, mm. a couple of nights ago, which was marvelous and it was um you know empowering for women mm. it was the gcc lexus nexus gcc women in law awards mm. and it's fantastic to see you know that women are coming through and being recognized for their work and achievements mm. um but wouldn't it be nicer to have a world where we're not separated for mm. our gender mm. they're just awards in law and women are just as entitled to win that award over that man mm. um, regardless of their gender mm. so whilst it's great to see that women are being recognized um, and valued mm. it would be nice if we didn't have to have that discussion yeah I mean certainly I mean this was uh, perhaps one of the benefits of the DIFC RCIA because in my experience particularly when it was a sole arbitrator and it um, they there was uh, an effort to, um, you know, to make, to appoint more women, and in fact, they they had statistics on this, and there was something they. It's like you say, if you have the information, then that's the start. You know, then you can sort of say, well, this is a situation. What are we going to do about it? Um, so it would be nice to see some of that coming through, perhaps with an, with the new uh, with the new DIAC. Um, and I think you're right. I, I have, I'm just thinking now of the cases I've been involved in. And in fact, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm working now with a tribunal, which is actually um, two women and one man. So, so I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, the, in, in the co one of the cases I'm involved in, I can see that there is a change, uh, you know, coming about. Um, I think so. I think the mindset of everybody is changing. And, y you know, as you've said, you've mm. worked and are working mm. um, with female practitioners, female mm. um, tribunal. Mm. And you're having a positive reaction to that. Yeah. And, mm. and I think, you know, it should be now that we're just basing everything on somebody's experience, somebody's yeah. reputation, mm. regardless of gender. Um, w we had a situation as Sol. Now, Sol, uh, the CEO mm. of Sol, of course, is Sarah Malik, mm. um, female. Mm. Um, I'm a partner there, mm. female. Mm. And uh, we have a, a great team mm. and paralegals, trainees coming through the ranks, female. Mm. Um, we do have male lawyers there. We have mm. Adam, who um, has come from Old Holborn Adams and works mm. as international council now we had somebody comment on uh, i think it was a social media post mm. um recognizing that we are um a female uh, more females than than mm. males at the firm and they made a comment about that saying something along the lines of is this a, a welfare group for women mm. something like that mm. and y you think would you be asking that question if you saw a law firm that was mm. the majority uh, of men mm. with with some females? Yeah. And I think we get to the stage where you have to say, well, we don't employ people because of their gender. We mm. employ somebody because they fit the criteria. Mm. And that's what we need to be looking at. We don't yeah. care if you're a man. We don't care if you're a woman. We don't care if you're... Mm. you know gender neutral yeah we care about what you bring to the table i think that's true and i think also i mean i've i've worked in um, in Dubai as, wo as well with an architectural practice that's, that works along the similar lines i mean the the leader uh, the leader is a woman and most of the employees are but it wasn't something that uh, you know we really uh, you know impacted one way or another that was just the way you know that that, w that, that was set up mm -hmm. um so I think it's, I think it's positive, and it, you know things are changing. It's interesting you mentioned Spain because I worked in Spain for 15 years in the construction sector, and I can testify that you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's virtually 50% in the professional sectors, 50% uh, men and women, and when you go to the universities and you see the, uh, you know, the engineering and construction classes, it's actually tipping 
to be more more women than men. Um, so, that's and that's it's it's interesting. Uh, of course, the site is always going to be a challenge because of the heavy nature of the work, which is you know that. But even then, you know, as technology uh, comes more and more into play, I think that that will also catch up. You know. Um, yeah, which yeah. it is. We yeah. do know that technology mm. is mm. having a huge influence on the mm. construction industry at the mm. moment. So uh, y you're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, and sharing your short your uh, thoughts with us. Um, it's been a, an interesting discussion, and um, at, uh, I'd just like to thank you once again for being with us. Thank you okay. for inviting All me. Right. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye.